On one hand, it's always good to be back in Georgia. I really love the country and you can uh, believe me, there are many, many people in the European Parliament who are big friends of Georgia. And so, of course, we are following the situation, the domestic uh, crisis very, very closely. And we had big hope. Well, we knew that actually with the visit of Charles Michel, we sent the highest representative of the European Council. So it was the president of the European Council. And of course, it was our expectation that Georgian politicians would understand what it means for the European Union. Afterwards, we had this uh, very experienced ambassador, this very high level diplomat for two missions here. And he took a lot of effort together with our EU delegation, head of the delegation and many other interlocutors to make it work. And so we are extremely frustrated. We are deeply frustrated about this current deadlock, about this blockade from both sides, while of course I would make the point uh, that the ruling party is much more <laughs> in the lead to change the situation, to make a difference, to make it work. And we see the opposition is not really helping in that situation, for sure. Uh, I was uh, stressing, emphasizing this from the very beginning. I, once, I was against the boycott. I don't think that helps anyone. I think that Georgian voters who voted for the opposition must felt betrayed with this situation. But on the other hand, uh, the ruling party has a lot of opportunities to solve this crisis immediately, if they want to. I hope that actually the political actors understand what is on stake and why it would be up to them to solve this. I mean, it's not our country, but of course we would like to see that Georgia um, gets back on track. We see there's Nagorno-Karabakh, Russia is pushing you. There's so many international and really global conflicts. We cannot allow Georgia to go down this path. And we see the impact and the um, consequences of, of the COVID crisis. The economical crisis will be even harder the next, I would say, three, four, five months. So we need a strong government. We need a functioning state. We need functioning institution. And therefore we need the political actors being aware of uh, what they risk. Um, and, but we in the European Parliament are now at that point where we say, okay, if there is not a political will to go for a compromise, to go for an agreement, uh, will this be a partner we would like to invest more money in? Will this be a partner we would like to financially support in the way what we have done before? And that's why we came up with uh, the I think the logic consequence to say, well, the next macro-financial tranche, the next macro-financial assistance must be linked to conditions. And these conditions are linked to reforms. And so therefore, I really hope that we see a delivering of the reforms so the financial, uh, macro-financial assistance uh, can, be, can be paid. The economical pressure will be there. <clears throat> Since um, the COVID crisis is not easy uh, to, uh, um, to, to, to overcome, um, Georgia will need money. But I don't want to be as cynical as many of the opposition. I don't calculate on the economical deprivation. I, I really would like to see Georgia on the rise. But since the reality will be difficult, Georgia should really keep in mind where, where they get the money from. Normally, the European par uh, Parliament or the European Union at least paid part of this money. If this money will be on hold, it might be difficult for uh, the ruling party to run this state and so they're risking a lot.